So my name is Alex Bullizel, and I'm presenting AV Leak, Turning Antivirus Emulators Inside Out. Uh, so a brief outline of this presentation. I'm going to start with some introduction, uh, moving to some background on this topic of antivirus emulation and anti-emulation, uh, discuss AV Leak, the tool that I built, go into some results and an actual live demo of AV Leak in action, uh, then talk about malware discovery, so uh, malware that I've discovered through the use of AV Leak. Uh, and then close with some remarks on future work uh, and what you could take uh, take this work and, and uh, follow with. So brief about me, um, I'm a recent graduate of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, or RPI, um, and I built AV Leak as part of my master's research under Dr. Bulent Yenner. Um, and at RPI, I was a member of RPI SEC, the uh, security club there and CTF team. Uh, so you first see that on you know, CTF scoreboards or anything, that's us. Uh, so what I built is AV Leak a novel tool that allows researchers to easily and quickly extract artifacts of emulation uh, out of commercial antivirus emulators uh, that can, you can then use to detect the presence of these emulators uh, and then write evasive malware uh, that detects it's being emulated and then behaves benignly so as to evade detection. Uh, and I would like in current work in this field, uh, work that's presented at recent conferences like Black Hat, uh, places like that, the real state of the art um, in the, the hacker community on this work, it's kind of like handwriting SQL injections. Like if you're in a CTF and you have a web browser and you're doing you know, dash, dash, select star, and it's, it's a real pain, um, real difficult. Uh, and AV leak is kind of like having uh, you know, like SQL maps, something like that. You just kind of point it at the emulator and, and let it rip and it pulls out all these artifacts of emulation uh, really, really easily without a lot of work and thought on your side. Um, so some background on this topic. Um, automated dynamic malware analysis. Um, static signature-based malware analysis is really useless in the face of uh, one million plus new samples of malware uh, detected per day. That was a recent estimate from, uh, I think, Symantec, um, was that they're seeing, they believe, uh, one million plus binaries uh, per day. So far too much uh, for a human analyst to look at. Um, uh, what you really got to do is go run these uh, malware samples uh, in an isolated, emulated environment uh, and see how they behave at runtime, see what they're going to do. Um, and then you can pick out uh, you know, signatures from these uh, pieces of malware, find unique ones you want to look at further, uh, and so forth. Um, so you're going to be looking for known signatures at runtime that packed malware might be presenting. So the malware is encrypted in a novel way. You, know, you can't match any hash against it, any uh, thing like that. But at runtime, uh, it decrypts into memory, and you can scan memory and find these signatures that you know are there because it's just the same common piece of crimeware packed a million different times. Um, and you can also heuristically classify malicious behavior. So the fact that this uh, binary did this uh, you know, unique thing that real you know, benign binaries should not, that's another way of finding uh, malware. So the problem statement, the problem with automated analysis systems is that malware can easily detect them and it can behave benignly. Um, and then what I wanted to do is actually make it easier to detect these systems uh, in a sense. How do we uh, easily find ways of detecting them? Um, so there's plenty of research on anti-analysis, anti-emulation, uh, detecting VMware, detecting Kimu, things like that. Uh, that's very well documented. Uh, you can just Google, Google around, and that's been you know, field of study for the past 10 or 15 years. Since the, the, you know, the dawn of emulation and virtualization, people have been finding ways that emulators and virtualized uh, you know, VMs are, are not like real systems. But a lot of that work has not uh, really looked at uh, the everyday products that people use to protect their computers, uh, consumer antivirus products, uh, things that you go buy at Staples or on Amazon or whatever, install them on your home computer uh, and expect them to be protecting you. So a traditional malware sandbox, uh, what you might be familiar with, um, looks kind of like this. So you have, uh, and this is kind of uh, basically every possible design of a, of a malware sandbox put together. So you might have user mode analyses processes, uh, you might have kernel drivers that are doing analysis, uh, you might have uh, process introspection or uh, v v VM introspection going on from outside of the VM. Um, it, it could be take all sorts of different forms, but generally what you're doing is on top of a virtualization layer, VMware, Kimu, maybe Xen at the hypervisor level, uh, you're running a real operating system, uh, usually Windows, uh, because most malware targets Windows, and, and then you're analyzing malware within that sandbox. Um, in a real Windows operating system that just happens to be virtualized. When the malware is done executing, you throw it away, tear the sandbox down, and start up a new one that's fresh, and, and put new malware in there, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and again, this is what's very well documented on how you would, you would detect that sort of thing. Now, a consumer AV emulator looks more like this. Um, you have an x86 emulator uh, that emulates the x86 instruction set, uh, you know, step by step, instruction by instruction. 
And then uh, alongside that, you have a user mode Windows API emulator. So that emulates the Windows API and all these functions you might find in DLLs and other libraries uh, that come with, with the Windows operating system. Uh, and those are, that's running within uh, the antivirus emulator, uh, which is likely running a system or some sort of high privilege. Uh, antivirus systems need a lot of privilege to watch systems, uh, to watch events going on. Uh, and often they don't really bother kind of isolating um, individual components or sandboxing individual components. They really just kind of run everything often in the same context with this high privilege. Um, uh, so the malware then runs you know, by itself. It's the only thing really running in that analysis environment there. Um, and it's being stepped through with the x86 emulator, and then when it makes a call to a, a library function, uh, the Windows API emulator is gonna step in and emulate the execution of a given Windows API function uh, for the malware uh, until it can then look for signatures that it knows there are there in memory or heuristically classify the malware. Uh, and this is happening kind of in real time uh, to protect real users' computers kind of in the field. Um, so this is you have this installed in your laptop, you download a file, you click on the file, once you've clicked on it, uh, a scan is triggered and they're gonna take that binary, go run it in this uh, sandbox and see what it does uh, in order to tell you is this malware or not, uh, if they can't identify it with a, a static signature based hash. Um, so this has to run very fast, uh, very quickly, not use a lot of RAM, not bog your computer down too much. Um, you know, users are just gonna uninstall the thing uh, if it slows them down too much and, and ends up uh, causing them more harm than malware potentially could. So, as I said, these AV emulators have a lot of limitations. Uh, you gotta run quickly, uh, gotta run without a lot of memory. Uh, you can't use a high-end virtualization system like Kimu, like Zen, like VMware. Uh, these are you know, proprietary and open source products, um, but they're you know, well worked on, uh, big teams work on them, um, lots of engineers. Um, you're, you're kind of building your own emulator, probably in-house with a couple engineers at your antivirus company, uh, and they have a million other things to keep track of uh, because you, know, you have a million plus new malware samples a day coming in. Uh, you also have copyright law that prevents you from redistributing a full copy of the Windows operating system. Um, so again, you could install Windows on top of VMware and run that uh, if you had a real high-end system, if you had a lab or something like that. Um, but you as an antivirus company can't distribute copies of Windows uh, because you're not selling licenses to use that, that copy of Windows and so forth. So you're just emulating the Windows API um, just like you, you, know, you run uh, the POSIX API. You, know, you have the standard, the Windows API has these sets of functions. You've got to emulate them yourself and build those functions out yourself. And then you also just have the kind of generally poor software engineering in the AV industry. It is pretty remarkable, um, but you know, these AV companies uh, don't necessarily have the best software engineering. Uh, there's been a lot of offensive work looking at these AVs and finding that they uh, disable common protections like NX, uh, like opting out of ASLR, things like that. Um, these guys are not on top of their game as far as security goes. Um, and probably not on top of their game as far as just general software engineering goes. They have to constantly pump out new updates, new patches, new signatures, things like that all the time. Not a lot of time to go back and, and fix old stuff. Um, it's just constantly this arms race and trying to keep up with the constant proliferation of malware. So uh, their software ends up being not necessarily the best engineered. Uh, and if it gets by, it gets by. So in terms of emulation detection, as I said, it's very well documented how you might go about detecting VMware, Kimu, things like that. Um, I did a big literature survey um, on academic research in this field, and uh, I came up with uh, this kind of uh, ontology of you know, five categories of emulation detection. Uh, first off, you have environmental artifacts. These are things that are in the operating system environment itself. So not the operating system that's, that's running, but the environment that the, the computer you're looking at is. So things like usernames, uh, what accounts are there, what are serial numbers for different uh, installed drivers or, or um, hardware extensions, what programs are installed in there, uh, things like that. Um, what processes are running, uh, what windows are open. Uh, these are environmentally specific to the specific computer that is being emulated. Then you have OS API inconsistency. So again, you're emulating the Windows API, but you're not running the real Windows API that Microsoft wrote, you're emulating it yourself. So you read the, you know, the MSDN documentation and then you go uh, write you know, functions that emulate different Windows API functions. So it's gonna be very hard to get those behaving exactly right as, as real Windows API would, uh, throwing exceptions when they should, throwing the right obscure error codes when they should, uh, respecting the fact that maybe Windows 7 versus Windows XP has different error codes returned, um, and you're trying to emulate one of those systems and then update things, and um, you have lots of inconsistency in the functionality of the operating system API. Network emulation, you know, malware often checks uh, for network connections, uh, and these uh, emulators 
emulate uh, network connectivity and often respond with you know, generic success messages or things like that uh, to network requests in an effort to goad malware into running further. Um, and that obviously is another vector for detection. You have timing attacks. Uh, these are very well documented against again, uh, things like VMR Kimu. Um, time uh, in emulated systems is very hard to get right. In fact, there's a paper um, called Transparency. Uh, compatibility is not transparency. It was published by a couple of researchers at Carnegie Mellon and a couple of researchers at VMware worked together in this paper. And they basically said it's almost impossible to get emulation of time correct and we won't even bother doing it because you know, 99% of users of virtualization don't need, they don't need cycle accurate or millisecond accurate timing. They just need to virtualize their you know, web apps or web servers, things like that. Uh, malware researchers who want exactly accurate timing that's uh, exactly like a real bare metal CPU would have uh, are a, a tiny minority of people who use virtualization. Um, so not only is it very difficult, uh, there's not really a lot of interest in making very accurate timing um, VMs. Uh, subset of that is multi-threading. Uh, things get even stranger when you have multiple threads running and you might have race conditions and you could uh, set up code that has specific race conditions that might be introduced or might be triggered when, only when you're in a VM. Uh, and then CPU, uh, uh, sorry, process introspection is the next one. Uh, that's looking at your own process when you're being virtualized. So things like how big is my memory space? Uh, what are addresses are stored on the stack in my process? Uh, what's in the heap within my process? Um, you could detect DLLs that are injected into you. You could detect uh, that you're running in this virtualized space that doesn't behave the way a real space might. Uh, you could look at um, you know, CPU cache problems, things like that, uh, related directly to the execution of your process itself. Um, and then finally, we have CPU red pills. So these are instructions uh, that when run in the CPU, on the virtualized CPU, uh, don't behave the way they would on a real CPU. Um, x86 is an incredibly complicated instruction set. Uh, the base instruction specification from Intel, as far as I know, has 906 instructions. That's before these crazy uh, SIMID instructions, vector math, um, DRM specific instructions, multimedia decoding, uh, crypto instructions. Just the base instruction set, you have 906 instructions. Intel doesn't even get it right between their real CPUs and their manuals, the way the, the spec works, um, nor do uh, virtualization systems. Um, they won't throw the right faults when they should. They might accept instructions that are malformed or, or uh, incorrectly encoded. Um, they might uh, you know, not set a certain status register, status, status flag after an operation. Um, and that's a, a very well documented field of study. There's actually a paper called A Fistful of Red Pills if you're interested in learning more about that. So in terms of finding those artifacts of emulation, we want to find them and be able to detect emulators. Uh, how do you do that? Uh, the most obvious answer that comes, up, comes to mind to me is you reverse them. Um, you know, you just take them and you throw the antivirus software on IDA, you start reversing it. Um, that's going to be very, very difficult, extremely time consuming. You've got to have expensive tools like IDA. Uh, and then you're going to have to have this expert knowledge, um, first of uh, reverse engineering in general. This is a very challenging task. You're taking on modular, um, multi-part um, software, very complex, kind of sitting there on top of the operating system itself, just as complicated or if not more than the operating system and not as well documented as the operating system might be. Then you have to load x86 really well. If you're looking at a CPU emulator, uh, you better be able to really understand x86 and how it behaves and uh, what to look for. Um, so you're actually a a reverse engineering out a CPU emulator itself. Um, you've got to know operating systems. If you're looking at this emulation of the Windows API, you should know, really know the Windows API well in order to be able to spot inconsistencies in their emulation of the Windows API versus the real one. And then you also have to know a lot about malware behavior because, again, these VMs target malware. They're designed to run malware. Uh, and the most interesting kind of spots to look at them for weaknesses and vulnerabilities and ways of detecting them are probably um, in their uh, kind of responses or their, their code that handles common malware behaviors. Like, for example, calling sleep in order to stall uh, execution. So you want, might want to look at their emulation of the sleep function to see how do they handle that. Uh, but there's plenty of other more you know, niche and obscure malware behaviors uh, that you need to know all about in order to effectively reverse engineer these things. And then finally, you have a limited lifespan. Uh, so you do all this work, uh, and then the AV company puts out version 2.0 of their AV emulator. Uh, they change the obfuscation technique uh, system used on their tool. They rewrite it. Uh, they recompile it. They do all kinds of stuff. And all your work is out the window. And, and say they use the new obfuscation technique, maybe you have to break through that uh, now to get into the thing to start reversing it again. It can be very, very difficult. Um, and again, these things may be obfuscated, may have anti-analysis features, might use custom uh, binary formats, things like that. It's, it's very non-trivial. You have to have a lot of this knowledge. 
That said, it is technically possible. Uh, here we have a reverse engineering stack exchange answer from Rolf Rolls. Uh, if you're not familiar with Rolf, he's probably one of the best reverse engineers in the world, absolutely brilliant. Um, and we um, posted a, a question over on Stack Exchange asking him about, or asking people in general, had they taken on this task of reversing antivirus emulators? And Rolf came in and said, yeah, I've done this a couple of times, and you know, gives some general guidelines on how to do this stuff. I, I tried uh, following through with this, and it, it is you know, very, very difficult. Um, still non trivially even if you are someone as brilliant as Rolf. But that said, it is technically possible and has been documented. I got to speak to Rolf at Recon about some of this work, and it's very impressive. So the real state of the art, uh, besides doing reverse engineering, is so-called black box testing. And this has been presented, um, perhaps the highest profile presentation of work like this was at Black Hat 2014 by Arnie Swidden and uh, Aladdin Masbahi. Uh, and they presented work uh, with, call, it was called uh, One Packer to Rule Them All. Um, and they made it a packer, then they were able to evade lots of antivirus simulators. And they did some, uh, some of this black box testing. Uh, so what you do is you begin with a question. Uh, is function x in the emulator emulated correctly? Or uh, you know, is this CPU opcode emulated correctly? Or is this environmental artifact present? But just a yes or no question, a true or false question. Then you create a binary that says, if function x is not correct or is correct or whatever you want to do, but you basically check its return code, you will then choose to either drop malware or to not drop malware to exit. You'll then compile this binary, throw it in the antivirus emulator, and then you'll run it in the antivirus emulator. You'll tell the AV, please scan this, this binary for me. Now, uh, when it runs it, function X will be run, and a result will come out of it. And then the, your binary will say, did we see the correct result or did we not? Uh, and then choose to either drop malware or not drop malware. And the AV will you know, observe the runtime behavior of this binary you've given it, see if malware was or was not dropped, and then you have one bit of insight in, into the antivirus's state. Um, it's basically a one-bit oracle. It answers this true or false question for you one bit at a time. So this is obviously very slow and very painstaking um, and you know, very manual. Um, and you're going to have to be doing this bit by bit by bit. Um, so this is best really suited for finding negative results. So finding, oh, function X is not emulated properly. Um, but many of these obscure cases, the edge cases, um, things like that. It's very hard to prove things that things are right, but it is easier to find things that are kind of wrong. Um, that said, you can kind of extract positive artifacts uh, of emulation out of there. Uh, environmental artifacts, you could do a thing like, say, get username, and if it returns admin, you then say, hey, was this first letter of what was returned A? Was it B? Was it C? Was it D? Or you could do a binary search over that range. Uh, but again, that's very slow, very painstaking. Uh, kind of like doing a blind SQL injection or something like that, where you say, you know, if the letter was you know, A, then we'll sleep or we won't. Um, again, very slow, very painstaking. Um, this particular work of doing is it you know, letter A, B, C, D. Uh, Kyle Adams, who's a researcher at Juniper Networks, uh, he presented some work at B-Sides 2014 in Las Vegas, where he did that to AVG's JavaScript emulator. Uh, and he extracted some small uh, amounts of information uh, from, from there using that technique. But again, he said it was very slow and very painful. So after giving that background, I'm going to introduce AVLeak, which is my tool and my uh, innovation on top of this work. So AVLeak is a tool and API for extracting uh, information from antivirus emulators without using binary reversing. It's built in C and Python, and it's very fast. Um, in terms of setting up a new AV and integrating one, you know, I can take a new AV, install it on a VM, and get it set up within a number of hours, mostly automated, mostly with just scripts running, and those scripts are going to take a couple hours to run, and I just kind of sit back and, and let them run. Then I can program test cases that uh, query and, and look inside this AV emulator and see what's in there uh, in a number of minutes. And I can test them and get results back in a number of seconds. So AV Leaks innovation is we make this one bit channel into an n bit channel, arbitrarily or large channel. We do that by mapping n encrypted malware samples onto n symbols. Uh, in this case, we use ASCII letters, but it could be kind of any symbol you want to express coming out of this AV emulator. That kind of looks like this. You have a table of ASCII letters mapped to various pieces of malware. So here I chose a couple common malware samples and, and mapped them like that. And what we do is inside the emulator, we take a reading, and then we drop malware accordingly to express what we saw inside the emulator. Um, so we need to start by taking a bunch of malware samples and packing them. So we take the sample, we encrypt it, we get an encrypted blob, and we stick it into our table here. Uh, here I've taken the range of 0 to 256, the ASCII range. Uh, in the middle there, uh, and the, again, the title is packing the K. 
Uh, that's actually from a rap video made by Kaspersky Labs. Uh, you can find it on YouTube by searching Pack in the K. It's an official video uh, from the lab uh, with two guys who talk about how great the software is. And uh, when I'm packing the K, he's my secret weapon, gives me anti-spam and antivirus protection. It's really funny. Um, so I thought this was appropriate for uh, you know, packing the malware and particularly letters, you know, letter represents the K. So look that up. So now inside the AV emulator, we have this big blob, this big array of packed malware samples in this table. And we make a call like get username. And let's say it returns AV emu for AV emulator. We now drop malware number 65, 86, so forth. And we drop the malware that in that table corresponds to the letters A, V, E, M, U. Um, and then the AV comes back and says, well, we saw this virus. We go back to our table, correlate that across, and we say, oh, well, you saw an A. And we proceed with the, the rest of the letters we saw. And now we know that inside the emulator, we saw AV emu um, and leaked that information out without doing any reverse engineering. So test cases that go into the emulator and test, test the emulator itself are written in C, as malware often is. Uh, they're write once and run, run anywhere against any AV. So any AV that you can talk to with AV leak that you have integrated with the, the system, your C test cases work against that AV. It's generic. You also have a Python API to build scriptable test cases, uh, meaning you can write interactive things, you can write fuzzers. Um, you can sit there and you don't have to constantly tweak things. You can say, I want to run this test, and based on the results of this test, run this other test, and so forth and so forth. Um, so you can build these dynamic test cases. You can also integrate with other applications, which is one thing I'm going to show during my demo. I integrated this with libcapstone, which is a great LLVM-based disassembly framework. And I was able to disassemble code that I found within the emulators really seamlessly uh, right there in my script. Uh, you could also, say, integrate it with a web app and make a kind of your own virus total type thing that leaks information out of these emulators. You could do anything that you know, talks to Python. You can start integrating with AVLeak. Uh, if you have a fuzzer made in Python, you can integrate that. Um, and again, it's easy to integrate new AVs. And it's automated with scripts. So kind of the flow of AV leak. We start with our test case. Uh, again, I've tried to make this very simple. Basically, it's close to writing real C that will run a real system and just print data out to standard out. Um, so this one is very simple. It's just going to print out argv0, uh, just what is the name of the program that's running. We pass it over to the AV leak Python code uh, that's going to do all this compilation and testing and stuff for us. So it talks to the compiler and it says, hey, please compile this test case. The test case, uh, we get a test binary out. We go talk to the AV and we tell it, please scan this binary for me. And the AV comes back and says, oh, we found this malware. And then we can uh, repeat this uh, kind of again uh, as we need to leak more and more information out of the AV. Uh, so I tested four commercial antivirus products, Kaspersky, AVG, Bitdefender, and VirusBlock ADA, or VBA32. Um, I chose these uh, AVs by uploading malware droppers to e uh, VirusTotal. So what I did is I created a dropper for the eCar virus. It's actually not a virus. It's a, basically a test case designed by a consortium of antivirus companies. Uh, and it's basically just to test if they can detect malware. Uh, so it's not actually malicious. And this was made like 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, so I just wrote a dropper that drops the eCar test case. And then I saw what came back from VirusTotal, what, were, what malware was identified. Uh, and what I looked for was unique identifications. So I found a bunch of the AVs all said, you know, eCar, not a, not a virus, dot this, dot that, dot the other thing, whatever. Um, and they were all exactly the same string. Uh, so then I did some look, looking around, looked at avcomparatives.info, looked at some other sites, and found that actually all of those products uh, all used the Bitdefender engine. So they had licensed out this one engine and used it across multiple products. Uh, so I chose four different AV products that used different emulation engines that had different detection names. And I also chose them to be kind of diverse uh, geographically. Um, and I tried to, tried to make sure that I was getting a, a wide range of things. Um, I only did choose four. You could look at more. Uh, but I really wanted to go for depth, uh, depth of testing and, and trying lots of different tests out rather than just the breadth of having a lot of, mal of AVs that I could talk to. Because again, it is so simple to integrate new AVs. Um, and uh, you know, just chose those four to focus on for now. And I also tried to choose them at a, a kind of a range of complexity. Kaspersky is obviously a really uh, very complex software, a very well-known uh, company in the antivirus scene. Uh, AVG and Bitdefender are a little less so. Um, and then v VBA is really not that well-known, uh, not a very notable company. Um, and sure enough, I did find that you know, their emulator was not nearly as well built as the other ones. Uh, so I want to see how that would play out. Um, you know, does the kind of reputation behind the software um, 
really is, is it really reflected in the emulators that they present? So now some results, and I actually want to have a live demo as well. So again, these are the five categories of emulation detection that I looked at. Um, just to refresh you on those. And we're going to start with environmental artifacts. I found hard-coded program names, computer names, product IDs, Macs, uh, registry entries, et cetera, uh, within these emulators. Uh, again, you're the only process running in the emulator when you're being analyzed there. It's just this one malware process. But real Windows systems don't just run one process. They're a multi-processing uh, operating system. You have multiple processes running at once, and you are able to see what other processes are running on the system. So I did that. I said, what other processes are running? and found like, lots of fake processes running within these systems. So they just hard-coded a list of other processes that were running. It was hard-coded hard -coded PIDs. Uh, and, and you could just look at that and find unique strings and stuff in there. You could look at open windows. Generally, Windows operating systems uh, you know, installs have windows open. When users are using the computer, there are windows open. And you can, again, enumerate those windows, see what windows are open. Um, and then just on the side there, I have a presentation of a couple artifacts I found. So you see argv0. Um, Kaspersky randomizes your name every time it's run, it runs you. AVG calls you MWL sample, like malware sample. Bitdefender, your test app. And VBA, your self.exe. And then you see get computer name. Uh, Kaspersky is random, but it's actually the same every time. Um, you know, I don't know what those other ones are. Um, but these are just like hard-coded in there. So every time in the AV you make a query to get computer name, uh, you get one of those strings back. And you can just say, oh, well, if I see NFZT whatever, uh, I know that I'm running in Kaspersky. I'm going to be benign. I'm not going to let Kaspersky detect me. Um, these are probably the, you know, these are the most simple artifacts to, to find, uh, but also the most simple to patch up and, and to fix. These are just like hard-coded strings left in this code and compiled. Um, so while they're very easy to find, they're also very easy to um, remove. File system and registry, another environmental artifact. Um, I, as, as I said, AVLeak has an interactive API. Um, so I use this API to recursively dump the file system and the registry uh, of these products. Um, so what I did is I went to the C drive and I said, show me all files in the C drive. From there, show me uh, you know, all folders within there. And I kept spidering out and enumerating every single file on these uh, emulated systems. Also did that for the registry of these systems. I found uh, here the first one, AEO Fantoma de Fisser. Um, that was in the Bitdefender engine. Uh, I translated that from Romanian to English using Google Translate. Uh, Bitdefender is a Romanian company. And it translates to, it's a ghost file that exists to say no dot bat. Uh, I don't know. It's probably an awkward translation. If anyone speaks Romanian and has a better one, I'd be interested. Um, but it looks like some kind of joke or some kind of reference to the fact that it's like a fake file. Uh, also in Bitdefender, see Batman. And within there, there's batman.exe, batman.com, batman.bat. Um, Kaspersky in the file system in this folder, see documents and settings, uh, my documents. You have all these files. These are only three or four out of about 40 files. Um, and if you look, uh, look at them, they look kind of random. But if you look really closely, you'll notice that these are actually kind of random. You just smash your hands on a QWERTY keyboard, you'd end up with things like this, like K-O-I-O. Uh, those are three adjacent keys that are all touching. Um, and you can look at these. You know, you'll see things like someone just ran their hands across the home row or things like that. Um, so clearly, you know, some guy just needed to make, make a bunch of, of random file names and just kind of smash their hands, so get this weird stuff. Uh, you find fake installs of other antivirus products. It's so, like you'll find like evidence in the registry um, and in the file system of like, like 20 different AV products installed. Uh, it's like the Kaspersky VM or the, the you know, emulator rather has like 20 other AV products installed, and all of them are also all running at once within the emulator, according to the, the process listing. Uh, file sharing clients, common software like that. Uh, Kaspersky had a bunch of registry entries related to World of Warcraft. Not quite sure what that was up with that. AVG actually had a Windows product ID encoded within their registry. Um, also found a bunch of uh, references to Far Manager uh, in the VBA and Bitdefender and Kaspersky. Far Manager is a file system manager uh, that is available as freeware in uh, former USSR countries. Um, so I guess it's very popular over there, and I found you know, references to it within these file systems. My hypothesis is that some uh, programmer at one of these companies basically probably you know, spidered their actual file system from their real computer and took all the strings and file names and just kind of made them to be that, made, made those to be the fake file system. Hence all the references to file manager, to various file sharing clients that they might be using to do malware discovery, things like that. That's, that's my best hypothesis. OS API inconsistency. Uh, you'll have functions fail, return unique wrong values, cause analysis to stop, so forth. 
Um, you have a lack of, of uh, permissions enforcement for the file system. So like the C system volume information folder you should not be able to write to, but in all these AVs you could write to it and open files in it and so forth. Uh, window and GUI in interaction is often not emulated. So again, these AVs present fake open windows on the systems, but when you actually try to interact with them, press buttons, uh, you know, send Windows messages, that stuff doesn't really often work, because malware doesn't often do that. So these AV companies aren't really focused on giving a um, high fidelity emulation of Windows and GUI interaction. Um, with an AVG, the format message uh, function um, should return a string describing an error message, like, you know, error, uh, this happened because you don't have permissions, or, you know, whatever error, whatever error happened, they just returned the error message in hexadecimal back to you, with the string mid before it, I don't know what, what's up with that. Um, there are plenty of these, but a lot of them are not very interesting to look at, it's just this function fail, size fail, sorry, fails silently, or this function always returns negative one, or always returns zero, or doesn't do anything. They're often not that interesting as things to present, but they're certainly there that you could exploit them and, and use them to detect emulation. Fake library code, this was really interesting. Um, you know, in, in Windows you can do get proc address and load library, uh, and you can request a pointer to a given function in a linked library. So I did that for kernel 32 uh, for all these AVs, and I actually did that for every single function in kernel 32, and I dumped out the instructions that were found there. Just what raw bytes are there when I say get proc address, what, what do I see there? Um, and what I found was this common theme across all these AVs was that uh, obscure or accepting instructions are used to trigger uh, function emulation when picked up by the CPU emulator. So what that looks like is here in AVG, we see the standard Windows API hot patch uh, prologue, uh, prologue. Then we see lock move EBX, 0x FF, and then the two byte uh, ordinal export number of the function that was just called. So um, my hypothesis is that uh, malware or programs in general don't often run lock move EBX and then have a number with 0x FF 00. So when the CPU emulator that kind of sits alongside with the Windows emulator sees that instruction, it knows, well, you've called get username or you've called get proc address, you've called load library, whatever other function you've called, it knows that uh, and it steps in and emulates that function for uh, the binary. In Bitdefender, I saw two different patterns. Uh, one, this, this kind of push, uh, a random three byte number, uh, and then you call this address, this invalidly mapped address. So presumably when Bitdefender uh, sees this call to this invalid address, the CPU emulator picks that up and knows that it needs to emulate a certain function. And again, the address varies, so it'll often be like the ordinal export number. Um, so it'll be one, two, three, four, so forth. And their emulator just picks that up. Uh, and then you also have this other pattern where they basically will do a ret to BF80001. Uh, and between uh, functions in Bitdefender, you'll see int3. Uh, real Windows systems, at least what I looked at, I had nops between functions in my kernel 32 on my system. Here you had int3. Uh, VBA, you have these two conditional jump, uh, one conditional jump and an unconditional jump. They both jump to the, just to the next instruction. And then move D word pointer, you know, this obscure address. The CPU emulator sees this. It knows it needs to emulate something. And then between instructions in VBA, you see the halt instruction sorry, between functions. Kaspersky actually gets this right. Real programs and normal programs, non-malicious programs, really shouldn't be looking at library code found within their process space. I don't know why you'd want to do that. Um, so actually, they will give you two instructions, and then they'll just generate random bytes per run, just like they give you random names when you ask for your own name with argv0. And actually, if you do enough of this, if you poke uh, at enough code, uh, they'll just hit you with a uh, heuristic classification, say, well, we heuristically think you're exploit.script.generic. So my theory is maybe they think you uh, are some kind of exploit or something, maybe you're looking to build a ROP chain, or looking to fingerprint the specific emulator or specific system you're running on, something like that. This is, is really um, pretty good. Uh, you shouldn't really, normal non-malicious programs, I can't think of any valid reason for them to be doing this level of introspection and looking at you know, loaded libraries within their process space, unless they're trying to do something malicious. Uh, network emulation, so Kaspersky, AVG, and Bitdefender all emulate network connectivity, and they respond with success to invalid network queries. And actually, they all respond with valid PE files. And I downloaded executables from all three of these systems when I made a network request, um, and I reverse engineered them and found more things that I could use to detect these emulators by saying, you know, if I make a network request and I see this specific file come down or this specific set of bytes come down in the file, I know I'm in the emulator. And this is probably a way of catching malware that might download a second stage or something like that or execute a you know, payload. Um, timing, 
Uh, I checked out a, a number of timing related APIs in Windows and also the RDTSC and RDTSCP instructions on the CPU. And I found that there was really no need for sophisticated timing attacks. There are very sophisticated timing attacks documented in academic literature, uh, detecting hypervisors, things like that. Um, but in these emulators, the timing emulation was hopelessly broken. And I also found that within them, uh, timing was another artif uh, emu sorry, environmental artifact. So you'd say, get, get time, and you would always, it would always say, oh, it's you know, October 3rd, 2011 at 7.02 p.m. Every single time you ask for the time. Um, so it was basically an environmental artifact in its own right. Uh, Kaspersky and AVG at least attempted to be realistic, and then Bitdefender and VBA were totally dysfunctional in their timing uh, API implementation. Process introspection. Again, there's lots of these, but they're not very interesting uh, to, to look at, kind of like the OS API things. Um, but these are a, a bunch of categories of things you could look at. Um, but you'll often just see, oh, this pointer is you know, not what I expected, or uh, this field is not on the PEB, or things like that. Uh, you can look at the stack above yourself after you run a function, so you can see if there was actual data left on the stack by the function that just executed. Uh, on a real Windows system, there would be. And these emulators, there might not be. Uh, you can also look at DLLs in memory after you call load library. Uh, load library returns a pointer to the start of the, excuse me, the DLL, so you should see the MZ header. Uh, if you don't see that, you might know you're an emulator. Um, finally, CPU red pills. Finding CPU red pills requires a lot of testing infrastructure. Um, we have some limited support for that, uh, but I didn't really focus on this because there, it's very well documented how to mount these attacks, but it does require a lot of work, a lot of infrastructure. Uh, one of the most cutting edge uh, papers in this field published last year, basically what they did is they sat a grad student down and had the grad student read an x86 manual and come up with 19,000 plus test cases for the x86 instruction set, which they then ran. Uh, those test cases aren't open uh, to the public. Um, so given a choice between doing that or doing kind of like just fuzzing out uh, kind of random patterns to try, um, I didn't want to go and do all the effort of building the test harnesses to, to do red pill testing. That said, we do have some limited support, but it's not that great. Um, but I did do some handcrafted test case creation, looking at unique instructions like CPU ID, like RDTSC, RDTSCP, um, instructions that are pretty weird, pretty obscure, and I expect would not be emulated correctly. And I found some really interesting, promising results from those. So some common themes uh, of these AVs is that extremely simple detection methods are very uh, are sufficient and don't really seem to get patched, don't seem to get updated, um, even when they're disclosed. Hardcore environmental artifacts are clearly you know, put in there from programmers, and they, they think it's funny to say you know, batman.exe or this is a ghost file.bat, but you know, that's another way of detecting these systems. Um, attempts to provoke malicious behavior, leaving 20 different antivirus products running, um, letting you write to all these different files, leaving files in the My Documents folder that malware might want to pick up and try to exfiltrate off the network, things like that. Um, so there's plenty of uh, things in there that they really try to make malware, make it uh, behave maliciously, give it a reason uh, to show its, its uh, true behavior so they know that it's in fact malware. And there's also a general lack of heuristic classification for emulation detection behavior. Academic literature has looked at this problem a lot, and uh, academics have come up with ways of detecting malware based solely on the fact that it is using anti-emulation behavior. Uh, but these AVs are not really doing that, other than that one instance where Kaspersky would say, here, uh, script.generic.exploit. So now I'm going to give a live demo of AV leak in action. Can everyone see that? All right, so here we go. Uh, as I said, AVLeak has an interactive API, so I actually wrote a script to do this all for me. So I just showed you argv0 in Kaspersky. Uh, over three different executions, the name of the product process that was running changed. Here in Bitdefender, we're leaking out the string test app. Now you'll notice that Bitdefender is going byte by byte and a lot slower than Kaspersky. That's because Kaspersky is able to detect 31 pieces of malware per run. Uh, so the emulator will see one piece and continue running until up to 31 pieces of malware have been dropped. Uh, Bitdefender will only take one malware at a time, one malware sample at a time. So it finds one piece of malware and immediately stops and says, we found malware. Um, in AVG, we have a very long path. So in the interest of time, I've abbreviated that and just skipped directly to the end where it says malware sample. In VBA, we're called self.exe. But again, this is in real time running and compiling, uh, you know, Right now, tens by the end would be hundreds of test cases, running them through the antivirus emulator, doing this translation back of what malware was dropped to what we saw inside. Uh, you see some weird stuff in Kaspersky's file system on the C drive. Archivos de Programas, that's uh, if you had a Spanish uh, Windows operating system. There are those uh, files where you can tell someone to just kind of hammer their hands against the QWERTY keyboard. Uh, now we're going to dump the first tens processes running within Bitdefender, so these uh, fake processes, they're not real. 
Uh, they're just hard coded to, to get a response uh, when you ask for what processes are running. Uh, While well, this is running, I can uh, briefly show you uh, what the demo code looks like. Um, again, we have an API, so we can just instantiate some of these you know, uh, AV leak objects, and then I have a bunch of test cases, and I can say, you know, AV leak dot leak, and, and, and so forth. Um, and so again, it's very simple, just, you know, uh, from AV API, import star. Um, and this is all running kind of in the background. We also have a command line tool for running these test cases. If you just want to run a single C test case, uh, you can do that. But uh, for, again, for Schmook on here, I just wrote this kind of automated. Um, so here we say test app. That's our process name. Again, as I said, argv0 within uh, Bitdefender is test app. Um, so we're running as PID8. So we're running before like essential Windows system services. It's really strange. Uh, in order to save time, um, just some PIDs. You have six processes running at PID number 12 within Bitdefender. Uh, that doesn't happen in real systems. Each, every single process has its own PID. Uh, here we see the format message uh, function. Uh, and you can see when the DW message ID is set to zero, we get mid 0000. And when we set it to dead beef, it's going to actually say dead beef. Um, for, the, for that first one where uh, message ID was set to zero, it should have returned the operation completed successfully. Here we're going to dump out VBA's code for the sleep function. And what you see, this is the raw hex bytes returned when we uh, call get proc address. And as I said, I have integration with other, other systems, other libraries. So I integrated Capstone in here, and I disassembled that right there in line for you. And you can see um, that code that's there. Um, so I guess, I guess sleep is export number uh, hex 3F3 within kernel 32. Um, and you can, you know, again, integrate Capstone really easily, things like that. Here on a real system, a uh, call to sleep one, one millisecond, actually incurs about 15 seconds of, 15 milliseconds, sorry, of overhead, the actual time it takes to go to the code for sleep, go into the kernel, you know, be paged out, be put to sleep, so forth. Uh, with an AVG, you sleep for exactly one millisecond. Uh, that's not realistic. Um, you know, uh, there's no overhead. So they probably just have an integer that stores current time, and they just increment it by one. In Kaspersky, you have the same thing. It's, it's hyper real. It's too real. Uh, you make 10 calls to sleep, for, so 10 minutes of sleep, and you incur exactly 10, you know, 10 seconds, uh, or sorry, 10 minutes in milliseconds uh, plus on the clock, the system clock. That's not realistic. In a real system, you have lots of overhead with actually, you know, making the call to sleep and your process is put to sleep for a minute and so forth. In Bitdefender, you get totally random values. Those are the same per run. So every time I run this, this script, I get the same weird numbers, but it doesn't even make any sense. I don't know how they arrived at, at those numbers for uh, a 10 minute difference in time. We made a request to google.com in Kaspersky and we got back this, uh, you know, PE file, uh, and again, I skipped through some interesting parts of it, but we see the MZ header, this program cannot be on DOS mode, we see downloaded in brackets, and then google.com. Um, also, I, I know in Kaspersky, when you look at actual uh, executables on the file system, so actual DLLs, like you open up kernel32.dll on the file system, you'll see again a valid PE header, and then you'll see in brackets, uh, KL auto-generated, presumably Kaspersky Labs auto-generated, maybe they have a script that makes fake PE files. Um, running CPU ID on AVG's CPU emulator, you get genuine Intel. And then running it with certain other flags set, uh, you get, it's, it identifies as an Athlon processor, an AMD processor, so that's inconsistent, kind of weird. Um, this is just the tip of the iceberg, and this is what I could just show you in a couple minutes here at Shmukon. Uh, but again, you can see how fast this was compared to that one bit testing. And if you've seen prior work in this field, uh, it is very tedious, very monotonous, and does not get a lot of information out at once. Um, well, this is a very simple attack on these systems. It's very powerful uh, and very easy to use, and it's never really been done or documented before. Now I'm going to talk about malware discovery. So I did all this work to find ways, find and learn about the AVs. What about malware uh, that's exploiting these vulnerabilities and these um, artifacts left in the systems? So advanced malware authors are already using these artifacts. If you Google some of them, like KL auto-generated, or this, this string, uh, this is a ghost file.exe, you'll find results here on Google. And this is just what I can find on Google with publicly available um, malware analysis sandboxes that analyze these binaries, run strings in them, and present the results of analysis up there on Google. And it's you know, indexable by Google. If you're an AV company, you're sitting on a big library of malware. You could probably find a whole lot more. And you could also look for things like specific strings, sequences of bytes um, that are related to anti-emulation behavior. Um, this is just what's available on Google. And I found uh, hundreds of, of uh, malware samples like this um, just by Googling certain unique strings that I found. 
Um, when I Googled the product ID found within AVG's registry, again, that instruction, I found this AVG evasive malware in a file called 22.xls, uh, hosted on a Thai school website, so like a middle school in Thailand, evidently got hacked, had this file sitting up there. Uploaded it to VirusTotal, uh, only three, two uploads before me within the past like two or three years, and I was the third upload ever. Um, and in it, I found hundreds of artifacts uh, related to AVG, mostly related to AVG's function emulation. So they did the LockMovie BX thing. Uh, so I found that, and there's you know, hundreds more instances of the LockMovie BX instruction. No idea what this was. Uh, I did do some research on this site, and, and it looks like they actually were hacked. There was some defacement uh, from some hacking group a while ago. Um, so maybe that's what that was. I don't know. It was really unique and really interesting. And that was the only result on Google when I Googled that particular string. Um, it was also really fun citing that in my thesis as a, as a source, uh, 22.xls. I was told that I was not following the citation format for an Excel sheet, and so I'm citing a piece of malware uh, online. And perhaps most interestingly was this evil bunny malware from the so-called Animal Farm APT. Uh, and I found that it was evading Bitdefender in 2011. Uh, so I was looking up testapp.exe, which is the process name within uh, Bitdefender. And you'll find within... Uh, like one of the first functions run by Evil Bunny before it goes into its main uh, payload is that it checks if its name is test app and then chooses not to run or to run based on uh, what its name is. It'll also not run if its name is this afyjemv.exe. Uh, my theory is perhaps that's a Kaspersky string uh, from em emulation. Maybe whoever made this uh, kind of like took a snapshot of Kaspersky and, and found that string. So one very naive approach to finding environmental artifacts that I did not touch on is actually you just run the AV process and you just uh, take a core dump and you grep through the core dump and you might find strings that are unpacked at runtime. Uh, they're not going to leave these environmental strings just sitting there uh, unencrypted uh, on disk, but a runtime then be, uh, might be unpacked. The emulator is sitting there in memory just like malware might sit in memory and you can grep through it and find unique strings. So perhaps they did that and found this string that they thought was using Kaspersky every time. I really don't know, but I do know for sure that test app is uh, Bitdefender related. So this was evading Bitdefender in 2011. This was reported on like last year um, and uh, you know, Bitdefender has not uh, fixed this as far as I know. Um, you know, last I looked when I, um, this is still sitting there in the Bitdefender emulator. They don't really care. Um, and this was highly advanced malware. It goes into have a whole like Lua thing. Uh, really crazy to, to see this. And now closing, uh, some remarks on future work. Uh, Want to integrate more AVs, test more of them. Again, I went for a, a big depth of testing lots of different test cases and not so much a breadth of a lot of different products. Uh, again, have more pre-built test cases. One idea for doing that um, is to use the Wine, uh, which Wine is a uh, compatibility layer for the Windows API for Linux, so you can run uh, Windows binaries on Linux. Uh, Wine has unit tests for the entire Windows API. Uh, so if we could take those unit tests and port them over to AVLeak, then we'd be able to test uh, these uh, APIs really easily. Currently, what I tend to do is I just go to the MSDN, I find the example usage for a given API, I copy and paste that out, and when they say printf, I say, you know, just call my extraction function instead. Um, but, uh, you know, it's very difficult to always set up the right structures, the right kind of things, the right states, and when you have functions that rely on other functions being called and structures being initialized, it gets a lot more difficult. Uh, so if we had Wines unit testing, we could make that a lot easier. And then, most interestingly, leverage AV leak for vulnerability research. So uh, this work was actually originally motivated by finding emulator breakouts. Uh, the original idea of this was proposed to me by Jeremy Blackthorne, a researcher at RPI who was a PhD student. Uh, and he wanted to break out of emulators. Um, uh, so we began this research uh, as an undergraduate research project about two years ago. Um, I then took it, uh, did, got some undergraduate credit for it, and then I ran with it and made it into my master's thesis and did a big literature survey and academic work in the field as well. Uh, but the original motivation for this was, in fact, a breakout. Um, it was not to necessarily leak information out. Um, and breakout, as I said, often is privilege escalation because the emulator is probably running as a system. It's not isolated. Now, I was working on this topic about two years ago with, with Jeremy. Um, but only recently has it received attention uh, in the hacker community, uh, most notably with uh, Tavis Ormandy at Project Zero, who's been going after AVs and finding tons of really trivial vulnerabilities in them, uh, many of them related to things like web, uh, web administration clients or uh, parsing of file formats. But one of them, and actually, I think actually the first uh, AV vulnerability that he dropped was uh, this June, the analysis and exploitation of an ESET vulnerability. And what he did was he took the ESET emulator uh, and played with it some 
uh, and found a vulnerability based in their emulation of uh, sub-ESP versus at ESP. And he was basically able to uh, take the ESP, the virtualized ESP, get control of it, uh, leak information out about the state of the real process that was emulating him, uh, and then break out of the emulator by building a ROP chain. Um, and it was really impressive, really cool. Uh, and that's really the only work that I've seen in doing this. Tavis is an incredible vulnerability researcher, incredible exploit developer, uh, far better than me. Uh, but I think it would be really cool to use something like AVLeak to enable that sort of work. Um, we also recently had the publication of the Antivirus Hacker's Handbook by Jukes and Corrett and Elias Bacalani, uh, another great book talking about vulnerabilities in AV products. Not so much with their emulators, but it does touch on that topic. Uh, so we're really only recently seeing some public interest uh, in this field. Um, so AVLeak's innovation. Traditional RE of AV emulators is time consuming. AV leaks very fast, runs in seconds to hours. You saw there we leaked out a whole bunch of artifacts of emulation in just five minutes. Expensive tools like IDA versus free tools like C and Python. Expert knowledge of all these different fields versus basic knowledge of C and the Windows API. If you can write Windows API code that just prints some data out to standard out, you can use AV leak. And then a limit of lifespan, uh, so when they update the AV product, your artifacts no longer work versus AV leak, which is very easy to refresh. You just get the new copy of the AV product, you run your suite of test cases against it, you can script that all out with the AV leak API, and now you're in business again with all these new artifacts of emulation. Biography and some related work. Um, Jeremy Blackthorne, again, thank you very much for his help. Um, this work presented at Black Hat, uh, doing a one-bit oracle work, some academic work uh, on anti-emulation and anti-anti-emulation. Um, a report on Evil Bunny from Marion, who discovered it, and then Tavis, uh, his analysis of ESET. Thank you very much to Jeremy Blackthorne, and my advisor, Dr. Bulent Yenner, uh, Patrick Bjarnat, and Andrew Fizzano. Um, these guys helped me build a prototype of AV Leak as an undergraduate research project, and then, as I said, I continued on for my master's research, and Dr. Greg Hughes. And also a big thank you uh, to RPI SEC, uh, the security club at my school that I was part of. A lot of these guys are sitting up here in the front row. Um, Big shout out also to RPI Sec. Um, Aaron uh, just released a class on malware analysis at GitHub slash RPI Sec slash malware. Uh, last semester, our club uh, taught a class on binary exploitation, uh, going from basic exploitation up to uh, contemporary exploitation. And just two days ago, uh, these guys dropped a class on malware analysis. It's, it's really great, so check it out. You might have seen it on Reddit, NetSec, or on Twitter. So, uh, any questions? So you could do that. Now, a lot of those perimeter devices are based on high-end emulator systems like VMware, like Kimu, which have well-documented attacks against them. Uh, it could be done, but a big uh, thing that keeps people from doing that is the fact that those devices are very expensive. Uh, Tavis was actually able to get his hands on a FireEye appliance at Project Zero and do some vulnerability research against them and found some cool artifacts, and, or exploits, rather. Uh, but again, it's, it's very expensive to get those systems. It's very cheap to buy a, a copy of one of these AVs and just install it on your computer. Uh, anyone else? All right, well, thank you very much.